Hi there, and thanks for joining us for Survival Tips and Tricks for Parents and Teachers Coordinating Learning at Home. My name is Francis Vigent. I'm a former teacher and a founder of NoAdam. And uh, I work an awful lot with districts and uh, teachers um, to transition learning from um, traditional models to next generation models. And a lot of what we're seeing right now um, uh, hope to be able to help you sort of understand the context for um, for some of this uh, uh, challenge that we're having, coordinating learning at home uh, in a broader sense, just classrooms everywhere. And then also um, really focusing in on some things that you can do to uh, basically help support your student, help support your school, um, and so on. So with that in mind, I'd like to just show you here a bit of an agenda. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is just look at the context for teaching and learning right now. It's very different, um, obviously, learning from home or teaching at a distance. Uh, the next thing is to try to understand a bit about um, how your student thinks that they should learn, because that's one of the big challenges is that there's a set of expectations that students walk into a classroom with that are set um, basically by their experience walking into classrooms on an everyday basis and that may or may not be helpful learning from home. And so understanding those uh, sort of helps you to one, um, replicate some aspects, but also uh, understand the aspects that you can't replicate. A third part here is just taking a look at a bit of child psychology. Really, how do children learn? Um, and how, you know, what are our definitions of teaching and learning? Next, I'd like to take a look at um, how we use questions to engage students in thinking and things that you can do at home um, or remotely if you're facilitating home learning as a teacher. Um, because kids that question think and kids that are questioned actually develop the skills to think. And I'll tell you what, um, uh, what I mean by thinking in a moment. And lastly, um, whether you're on, a, on the teaching side or the, uh, as an adult on the teaching side or as an adult on the parent side or caretaker side, um, how do I understand what is valuable work in the context of remote learning, uh, teaching and learning? Um, one of the big challenges that folks are facing is just being purely inundated right now with lots and lots of, you know, quote unquote work. Um, what is it that's really valuable? Uh, how do I prioritize? Uh, if I can't get to everything, what is it that really matters? And um, I'm going to show you some tips and techniques, not just with questions, but here with um, reading. How to read more deeply with your students and some give, offer you some tools for um, things that you can offer to parents of your students or as a parent you can use with any reading um, that your child's doing actually in science or even outside of science. So uh, we have about an hour so I'm going to uh, go right ahead here. So the first bit is context, really the, the three big pieces um, of context for remote learning today. One is home as a learning space. So under the unique circumstances of this sort of COVID-19 uh, home quarantine situation that we're facing is that there's a lot of stimulus in student environments for learning. Uh, that their brothers, their sisters, their parents, their aunts and uncles, everybody's home. Uh, and they're home in the same space they're trying to learn in. Um, there are our favorite toys, there are our favorite foods, there are all of our favorite things that are there. And so, um, there's a lot competing for children's attention. Structure. Um, not every home is the most structured environment, but with everybody home, we have to realize that there is a huge um, problem, even for adults, I, I would say for myself, um, creating structure for ourselves because so much in our environment has changed. Um, we don't need to get up to go to work. Uh, we're working from home potentially, um, or we need to have some kind of a childcare situation because we're essential workers. 
all of these things are changing the structure of the day for adults and for children. And teachers are not used to structuring their time in terms of Zoom meetings. Um, they're used to, you know, um, art class and then, you know, recess and then reading and then lunch and then reading. So the structure is not driven by hard constraints in the day the way that it used to be. Um, and we're going to talk about in a second, what does that mean? Um, routine. So the routine of, of how our day is structured at school is very different um, in the sort of things that we might be used to. For example, students um, might be doing school in their pajamas. They might be eating while they're on Zoom. Um, the routines are all different. And so because there's such a different structure or lack of structure, or different routine or lack of routine in, in homes as a learning space, it's really important that parents recognize and that teachers and school leaders communicate the, the, the need for structure and routine. Um, I don't mean that in a uh, very like rote sense, but the idea that children can understand their day through the routines that they're working. Like we get up at a certain time, um, you know, we eat at a certain time, and then, you know, we explore, we do school, we go outside. We, there are certain things that we're gonna do throughout the day. Um, and that routine can be fun. It, it's just creating a structure so students have a predictable um, set of expectations for what will be a part of their day. And that will be helpful for parents as well because as students understand what to expect in the structure of their day, that structure becomes a routine, it becomes an expectation, and that then gives us something to support as teachers, um, as a school community, um, as parents, and uh, we can think about how uh, tasks and activities fit within the structure of our day and our routine. Um, and, you know, the structure of your day and routine may involve, and I'm not advocating that you uh, not socially distance, but it may involve going on a hike or it may involve, um, you know, something like that where you can socially distance, but yet um, maybe, you know, um, engage something that's part of the learning that's going on right now for your student. So think, and that could even be going in the yard. So thinking about home as a learning space really takes thinking about these four elements. Now, parents as in, as in, in person support, uh, big thing here, um, what is learning? So parents will have their own definition of what learning is, the methods that are um, appropriate in their view for learning, and that's all going to be based on their experience as a learner, but we also have to remember that their experience as an educational support is very different than uh, a classroom aide or a teacher or, you know, somebody who is used to trying to um, achieve an educational outcome, a specific set of educational outcomes with children. Um, another piece is patience. Um, we have to also look at parents, um, and as parents ourselves take a deep breath, as you know, we are with our children in this home learning space 24 seven right now. Um, that is a test of patience. Um, and also by virtue of parent, the, the caretaker child relationship, um, children understand how to push their parents' buttons. And so we kind of have this this cocktail right now, whereas where a parent is trying to act as an in-person support and a child is, you know, potentially um, acting out as a result of lack of structure, routine, um, over, being overstimulated, being overtired because the structure is different, um, eating differently, who knows what. All of that's going to cause tension and and try the patience of parents, it caused tension between parents and students, and potentially teachers. 
so thinking about teachers as remote facilitators, um, it's really important that we communicate what learning is uh, to parents and, and the methods and the, um, that are part of that that we're trying to use. Um, technology is a factor. Um, you know, one of the things that um, teachers are facing and administrators as well is that if they have done a, a, a solid, um, if they've made a solid investment in communicating what learning is and the methods to the greater community of parents and involved them deeply um, and done a good job of that, things, remote learning is going to go a bit more easily. Um, chances are if that investment's been made, um, people are co have congregated around specific technologies um, and understand what technology needs to do in order to enable high quality learning and the methods that are necessary. Um, however, that's not most communities. And uh, I would even say it's probably not most teachers given the, the level of challenge and um, sort of lack of notice that everybody faced with these quarantines that are in place. So the experience employing those methods and technologies um, may be very limited or even non-existent. And one of the things that we'll kind of take a look at here is that, um, you know, learning is, learning is, um, it's something that happens. It's, it's not something that can be um, done through a rote process. And so there's a lot of technology that's been adopted in schools, which um, has great marketing. But when you think about what's really necessary, and I think that this is a lot of what communities are reacting to, a lot of the technology that districts has, have purchased is extremely limited. And when you think about um, its effectiveness and really engaging children and learning deeply, it's, um, it's, it, it's much more limited than the features in the marketing may have um, led them to believe. So anyhow, so that's why we're seeing folks downloading Zoom uh, or go to webinar or Google Hangouts and actually engaging that maybe for the first time ever, um, maybe not having considered it as a, as a classroom tool, uh, as a result of this COVID-19 quarantine. Um, and in fact, those technologies are proving the most valuable because what they're doing is they're enabling teachers and students to connect um, in ways that they would normally connect, but just through a different medium um, or to connect more deeply when they would have to, you know, otherwise rely on email or something like that. Um, so, Anyhow, take a deep breath. Everybody's sort of in this together. Um, what's really key to take away from this is how, you know, as parents and as teachers, do we define effective learning in similar ways? And uh, the reason that's so important is that if a teacher defines effective learning one way and a parent defines effective learning in an entirely different way, then what's going to happen is, is you're gonna to start to have tension. Um, and that's going to create chaos. It's going to create trouble with communication. And um, it's also going to create trouble in terms of how that home learning space is set up in order for teachers to engage their students and students to engage their teachers or even their peers. Okay, so we need these three things, the home learning space, the parents as in-person supports, and teachers as remote facilitators to be a well aligned. And the point of alignment is how we define effective learning, okay? Now, it's important to realize that students have their own definition of effective learning. And here's how that gets developed and where it comes from. So um, basically it starts with the principal's vision. And you might say it even starts with the district's vision but the district hires the principals and the principals tend to be the ones anchored in that community long-term. So principals vision is really like, why are we all here at school? Um, how do we engage in our work as students and teachers? Um, and what is acceptable in terms of learning? And so what comes out of that are school behavior, school values and school expectations. Now the principal hires and evaluates teachers. So these behaviors, values and expectations actually 
um, define success from a teacher's point of view. So it's how teachers define success. That defines how students are taught in classrooms by those teachers, and ultimately how your student or how your children define learning well. What does it mean to learn well? So a quick example, if, um, if the behavior is um, coming to school on time, sitting down and being quiet, and we value children um, listening and remembering, and our expectation is that children will do good on their standardized testing if they you know, come to school on time and they listen and they sit down and they do the work that they're given, that's, if that's how the school, what the school values, that's how a teacher defines success. So teachers will teach students to come in, to sit down, to listen, to fill out the work that they're given. And if they can remember and, and give that work back, um, as you know, they were told something, then that's, the, te the teacher will see that as successful students and the t students will see themselves as successful when they come in on time, they sit down and they listen and they do the work and they give it back, okay? Now, the problem here is that all of that is a very highly controlled physical structure model. Children are learning from home now, okay? They don't really have to come in and sit down and be quiet and so on. You know, um, they can mute themselves on Zoom. <laughs> you know, they can, there's a lot of things, um, they're already at home, they're not going anywhere. Uh, so, so that skill set um, and that value set is very challenged in this. From a student's perspective, if they're not if if they're not being asked to come in and sit down and do their work, and having that physical structure, they're missing all of the cues that they are used to expecting, and that they see as um, the behaviors and the values of being a good student. So they don't really know how to learn well in this new environment. If this if that was the type of um, behaviors and values and expectations that they've experienced through their school, um, so on. So one of the favorite, one of my favorite quotes to think about in this context is uh, Vysotsky's quote, children grow into the intellectual life of those around them. School is no longer about a quick right answer, but it's about the ongoing mental work of understanding new ideas and information. The reason I bring this up is that what we're seeing with everybody being locked in their homes, um, engaged in this remote learning, is is a real disparity among communities because what happens, and it can even be within the same town uh, or even within the same school building, um, essentially, you know, there has been this transition going on for almost 20 years now. I mean, this actually, this quote goes back to the 70s even. Um, but what's happening is, is that, um, Schools, and in particular, classrooms that are about getting right answers and doing, quote, work, um, completing specific tasks in order to get specific grades, and so on and so forth. What's happening there is that um, the, that structure is gone, um, or students are just being given lots of tasks. Um, you know, a particular worksheet to do, a fill in the blank, um, that sort of things that they can turn in. Think of it that way. Okay, they're being given things to turn in. Other communities, what's happening there is if they've made this transition from the quick right answer into something that's more about the ongoing mental work of a new understanding of ideas and information, what's happening in those communities is that students are being given challenges. They're being given um, they're being given context that they have to work with to try to understand and to try to give their opinion about. And so that's very different. So what's happening there is that when there are Zoom meetings, it's not about being told something or being having a question answered. It's about having a discussion. And it's about bringing ideas to the table. And it's about um, students asking, you know, basically having a kind of Socratic dialogue. Um, it's about students having engaged in a context, maybe having read something on their own or with their parent, and then maybe, or a teacher maybe reads something about a context, and then there's just a class discussion about it. 
And so kids are really coming to the table and doing the mental work of making connections and trying to understand the information and to try to think about and listen to what other students understand. So that's a real sort of disparity um, between different uh, classrooms and different students' experiences. And this is where we see parents um, potentially getting very frustrated in a, in a traditional sense where um, students are given lots of content from a teacher, um, things to answer, things to turn in and so on. Um, and in a lot of communities, this isn't even being graded. It's, it's being done, and I'll kind of explain how that works. But um, other communities, the kids are involved more with these peer meetings and um, the parents may be engaging as thought partners, but it's very different. So, so here's, here's where that all comes from, okay? And, and um, the reason I'm putting this first is I want you to think about it to understand um, when you're engaging these different techniques and trying to prioritize the work your child's getting, you need to understand where it's coming from. Um, and if you're trying to assign or create lessons or tasks to understand what may be more effective and also where maybe holding onto a more traditional model might be hurting. So here it goes. So this is a traditional school vision. Um, and it's something that most parents have experienced and this is how most parents will define learning if they view themselves as the teacher at home now. Um, it's basically that the teacher explains or lectures students and the students listen and they are judged by their ability to remember re-explain. Now, this breaks down at home because now teachers are judged instead of as, you know, just being explainers. Um, in a traditional model, they're judged by the work that they assign for home. And the teacher might also be kind of a remote lecturer or a person who explains things via Zoom or through recordings. And they're the ones that are doing the correction. They're becoming the quote, work corrector. So if, if the teacher's sending lectures or they're, they're answering questions remotely um, by Zoom, they may be still in that central role, okay? However, if they're not, it's the parent that becomes now the teacher. So it's, it's the parent who's sort of judging themselves by their ability to explain or to lecture or to get their kids to complete the work that's being given by teachers. So that's why it starts to create a tension between parents and teachers. And the students are still just trying to do what they see as their job, you know, listen, remember, explain, but like my parents aren't doing a good job at that or my teacher's sending me recordings and I can't open them. You know, these are the kind of things that are happening. Um, now, it's important to think of thinking as a tool for deepening understanding. Where a lot of these, this work that's being assigned runs, runs into trouble is the kind of thinking that it requires. Most of the time it's remembering or applying information, okay? It's very, what some people would call lower order thinking, not critical thinking. Now, applying and remembering is important. Those are tools for developing and understanding, but creating, evaluating, and analyzing are also tools for understanding. And so these tools are things that are used kind of in conjunction with each other, just the way that you, you know, if you were building a shelf, you wouldn't just use a screwdriver. You'd probably use a saw, you'd probably use a, a paintbrush, you might use a drill. Okay, those are all different tools. Well, sometimes, you know, we create and then analyze what we've created. Um, we evaluate what something somebody else has created as a way of understanding it more deeply. Okay, so these, using these tools um, in this context of a traditional classroom just really is difficult. Um, and so, again, if, you're, if you have a more progressive classroom, um, typically, and then as a result of this lockdown, all of the work that's being sent home is really lower order thinking, remembering, applying, um, that's something that you need to communicate back to teachers and, and try to act as a thought partner about how maybe we can focus more on analyzing, evaluating, creating, and sort of have this be a more well-balanced experience. Because remember, a teacher now may be viewing, sorry, I'm jumping around here a little bit. They may be viewing their value 
if they're coming from a traditional background, as being the work giver. Um, in a tr in a next generation environment, um, it's not even about technology; it's about intellectual engagement. Okay, and that brings me to how we learn. Um, how children actually learn, it's a consequence of thinking. Okay, and this is one of my favorite quotes around it. Uh, that learning is a consequence of thinking, retention, understanding, and the active use of knowledge can be brought about only by learning experiences in which learners think about and think with what they are learning. Far from thinking coming after knowledge, knowledge comes on the coattails of thinking as we think about and with the content we are learning, we truly learn it. So in essence, learning is all about context. And the way that our brains learn is that we process context. We don't process facts. And so in a very simple sense, I just explained to you what goes on in everybody's brain and in particular for your children. Um, so essentially, we encounter a context, our brain has a feeling about it. If we have a feeling that is interested or curious about that context, or we think positively about it, what happens is the information, that context, the information that's in it, gets handed over to another section of our brain that begins to process the language and, and make connections between the language. And so processing that context now gives us um, sort of a kind of a coat rack where all of the hacks, uh, sorry, all the facts hang, okay? Now, here's the thing. If we try to present facts to students, our brain goes, I don't know what to do with that. I feel bad or weird or I don't care about it. And so it, those facts never get passed on to the other part of our brain which actually processes language and can think about those facts. And so there's no, there's no context for the facts to hang on. And what happens is, is that the brain just shuts off. And so what you'll see is that um, with a lot of rote work that children are being given now, and it's, the thing is, is that a lot of this children are given rote work in classrooms. Um, and so people have you know, behavior issues with children in classrooms. Well, a lot of it is because the method or the work or the activities um, or tasks fight the very structure of a child's brain, which is driven by curiosity. It's driven by purpose. It's driven by questions about why. And so, um, so if you're having that issue at home, you really need to think about how your child's brain works. Um, and, and if you're trying to engage them in a lot of rote work that you've been given, you need to start prioritizing that work um, and start with the work that um, we can engage in with curiosity. And a big piece of engaging your student with this type of work is to ask questions about it. Why? How? What if? Those types of questions um, will spark a student's curiosity and will cause them to begin to have a feeling about what it is that they're learning and will allow their brain to begin to process the language. Okay, so it's a really um, sort of simple technique, um, but the problem is, is that a lot of times the work children are given, it's so, it's so um, base and it's, you know, match a fact to a definition or match a vocab word to a definition that there really isn't a, a basis for questioning because there's just not enough context. It's just a fact. And so that's where students begin to act out because essentially their brain is shutting down and they're saying, I, and they start to be kind of basically build an attitude around work. Um, and even the whole metaphor, the idea that school is work, uh, that children are the workers and teachers are the you know, work supervisor slash, you know, boss, um, that metaphor is really um, unfortunate and actually causes trouble in all this. So it's much better to sort of think, think about tasks as opportunities to think about things and to discover, and then 
let's be curious about this. Like, let's ask questions. How, why, what, what if, how could, um, should that happen? To, why shouldn't it? Um, those sort of things. That Those questions are what spark uh, real learning. And so we talk about thinking moves. So what we want to do is we want children um, to function in an environment in our homes um, that is all about thinking. And so how do we do that? Well, we're not only going to use questions, um, but we need to be on the same page in terms of what we expect, expect of thinking and learning in school. Um, these eight thinking moves are from a book called Making Thinking Visible, and I would highly recommend that it's by Ron Richard. Um, if you're a teacher, if you're a parent, um, there's a great DVD that comes with it. It's available on Amazon. It's really a short book, um, totally worth getting right now if you're stuck at home. Okay, so if a student is thinking, what is it that they're doing in their minds? These are the eight things. They're observing closely, describing what's there. They are engaged in building an explanation or an interpretation. They may be reasoning with evidence. They may be making connections. Um, considering different viewpoints and perspectives, capturing the heart and forming conclusions, sort of basically kind of trying to get at the essence of what something's about, uh, wondering, asking questions, going below the surface and trying to understand the complexity that is part of a phenomena. So in the context of science and engineering, these are things that we would engage in, um, in a context that would involve phenomena. So you could actually walk into your backyard if you are learning a, um, or outside of your apartment, um, provided it's safe to socially distance and do so. And just if, if you're dealing with a, um, a lesson on weather, observe the weather. Try to explain the weather that you're seeing um, and not do it for a child, but actually engage the student's curiosity in doing it for themselves. So for example, why do, you, why do you think it's raining today? Or how come, how come the rain makes the ground wet and it disappears? And those kind of questions, those kind of observations will get children looking more closely at things and making connections and reasoning with evidence. And then you can come back and say things like, well, what if the, you know, what if, um, you know, what if I told you the rain doesn't actually disappear, that it's changing, and that's why it's not making the ground wet anymore. And so probing more deeply this way, um, what's happening is, is that we are, use questions in order to engage students in thinking moves, sort of um, forcing students to engage in these kind of moves. Now, that typically happens in a very different type of school vision, okay? Not the vision like we saw here a second ago, okay? This is the traditional vision. A next generation vision looks very different. And I apologize for jumping across slides here. Um, a, a next generation vision looks like this. It, it's something that very few parents um, have experienced and even very few students have experienced, but essentially it's where the teacher acts as a coach and uh, uses their skills with questioning in order to listen and mirror and to cause students to engage in thinking moves, okay? The students in this type of teaching and learning environment in a, in a traditional, in a, in a classroom would um, understand that they learn well by listening and questioning and reasoning cooperative, cooperatively um, with others and using their thinking moves to in, in some context to develop their own understanding of ideas, okay, and what they think may be happening. Now, this runs into struggles at home because the teacher is now maybe remote by Zoom or Google Hangouts or our tool Soccer Circle or YouTube, who knows, um, but they can still listen and question and mirror those students remotely in ways that cause the student to engage their thinking. What's great here is that if this connection remote breaks down, as long as the student has a context for that content to work with, they can engage those skills from the classroom to develop and use their ideas to come to a better understanding of the facts and of the content at home. 
Now, where do parents come in? Well, this is where parents come in. See, parents are there in person, and so they can act as a support to that teacher, and um, they can do so by being an extension of the teacher who's listening and questioning and acting as a thought partner to their child in person, okay? So that, that takes a connection with the teacher to understand what the goals are, what is the context that we're working with, um, what are some of the learning objectives, what is the experience that um, is going to be happening um, that is going to cause my student to be able to engage intellectually um, with the concepts and sort of wrestle with them and, uh, and come to a new understanding. Um, so that parent acts cooperatively with the teacher in engaging with their student, but the teacher is still acting cooperatively with that student. And so the student is still listening and questioning and reasoning with their parents, but also with their teachers and also with their peers, most likely. Um, and they're doing this remotely. Okay, using thinking moves in order to develop their own understanding um, of the disciplinary core ideas and cross-cutting concepts. Okay, so that's why coming back to where we were earlier, when we think about these three pieces, the home, the parents, the teachers, in the, in the context for today, learning remotely today under this COVID-19 quarantine so many are facing, it all comes down to, do we value the same model of instruction? Um, are we communicating our understanding as adults between teachers and parents and you know, back and forth? Um, because this is the basis for creating, collaborating uh, on the space, the lessons, the activities that will serve children best and will uh, lead to the structures and the routines and the supports that will make learning at home more seamless than it otherwise would be. Um, it also, uh, by virtue of this process, uh, brings to light where the model of instruction at school um, and the kind of work that we find acceptable as adults in education um, falls short. And um, if you're at home as a parent and you're looking at the work and saying, wow, this is all busy work, it probably is. Um, it's not that valuable. It, it probably isn't. Um, you know, to be able to be a teacher takes an awful lot of skill um, and experience and, and pedagogical understanding or sort of understanding of methods. Um, and it's typically very apparent when those things are in place and when they aren't. Now, I don't want to come down hard on teachers in schools here because teachers are at home with their own children. <laughs> you know, they have sick relatives too. Um, they're dealing with trying to be a teacher and a parent and uh, everything um, as well. So cut them some slack. But on the flip side, um, you know, the home learning experience should not be um, the equivalent of filling out paperwork. Um, and getting ans questions answered um, by, by Skype or by Zoom. Um, it should be much, if anything, less is more. So it should be about students engaging with each other and their teacher remotely by some soccer circle tool like we have, but, um, maybe a Socratic dialogue, by Zoom, by um, Google Hangouts or something like that. But coming together around something that's real, around a context about a scenario, and engaging in those thinking moves in order to deepen their understanding and also to develop that, those thinking uh, skills as tools for developing their own understanding. Um, the facts are, have very limited use. Now, one of the things I wanna show you here is something that we call picture thinking reading strategy. Now, this is a way to um, read with your kids at a deeper and more engaging level. And you can do this in science. You can do this with a book before bed. Um, I'm going to show you how this works. And you will be amazed at what even your kindergarten or preschooler comes up with. But the, the, the basics of it is, what do I notice? Forget the words. What do I notice in the image? 
What do I think that image tells us? Um, is trying to tell us, and what do I think as a result of, you know, what's in this image and what I think it's trying to tell us that this particular book or this particular page or section is about? Okay, and the way that we go about doing that is a very, um, it looks more complicated than it is, a very simple process. So we use a photo, okay, the photo on the page of the book, or it might be an illustration even, and we try to observe one object, one action, and one property. Okay, so you could be reading the magic school bus together. Okay, what's an object that's in the scene? What's an action that's happening in that scene? What's a property? And so a property is like an adjective, you know, cold, warm, um, fluffy, hard, um, that sort of a thing. Now we haven't read anything on that page yet, but we're just looking at that photo with that illustration. And now what we're gonna do is what we, we're gonna be curious. So we're gonna think what this page may be about. So what do I think this page is about? And so the student might say, well, you know, based on, on that object and that action, that property, I think this page is about weather. And so, okay, well, let's actually read that page or that, that section and let's find out what it's actually about. Now, depending on the age of your students, um, annotating is nice, but you need a really simple way of annotating. Um, annotating, unfortunately, and I hope your children aren't experiencing this, but um, it happens in classrooms. Um, oftentimes, teachers will read and underline or highlight, essentially annotate for the children. And so the children will then copy what the teacher has underlined or highlighted or so on. Um, the problem with that is the child, it's not authentic. They don't understand the significance of any of that, especially, honestly, it's, it's true of older grades as much as younger grades. They get lost in, I need to highlight from this word to that word. They don't really understand why it's being highlighted, even if somebody tells them. Um, so the kind of annotation needs to come from the student. And I'll show you um, how we often annotate. It's right here. If they find something wonderful or wowing, they should put an exclamation next to that word or phrase. If they find something might confuse somebody, they should put a question mark next to that word or phrase. If they have a connection that they can make to that word or phrase, put a plus sign. If they think something's really important, they can make a little asterisk. Now, if you have a first grader or a kindergartner and they can't read at all, they don't need to annotate. Or they may tell you as you're reading and you maybe follow along with your finger on the words, wow, you know, make an exclamation point there. Or that's kind of confusing for people. Make a, make a question mark. Sorry, the other one was an exclamation point. Or I have a connection to that plus sign. Okay, very, very simple way to ad adapt this. Okay, um, the last bit is to discuss what this made me think. So we just read this, so what did this make, what did this make me think? Um, what did it make me think about? And to sort of summarize together, so, so we thought the page was about this, but then when we read it, we were wowed and confused and we made these connections and we think this is important, what's that page really about? Is it about what we thought it was about? And this is how children come to a new understanding. Because essentially what we've done here is we've engaged students in taking intellectual risks in stages. But these stages happen very quickly. These are three things I noticed. This is what I think that page is about. Let's read that page, okay? One page, like in our reading, takes about 40 seconds to read at a normal rate. Um, and again, just the adult can read it and the child can follow along. What are the things that stood out to us? You know, what did it make us think of? What confused us? What, and then when we talk about it and we reflect back on what this, we talk about what the page was really about, we reflect back on what we thought, that causes our, sh our thinking to shift. And that's a new understanding, okay? And what happens is, is as you go from one page to the next in a book, you start to notice 
different things. You start to actually build an understanding of that text or of that piece by observing, thinking, gathering the actual evidence from the text by reading it and reflecting on it, and then shifting our understanding. Okay. And what's great about this is this becomes a tool for children to, to read better. Uh, and when I say better, what I mean is, is more deeply. Okay. Now, if you're a no Adam user there within the interactive down the bottom on the supporting resources for every grade level, you'll see the picture thinking graphic organizer and the picture thinking information sheet that looks uh, like this. So if your child is at a level where they would be writing, um, so letter formation and words and so on are, are not a huge issue, um, you can use something like this. And, and so before any reading happens, student can go through on page four, let's say, I'm gonna make that up, uh, page four, the op one object, one action, one property, write those words in there. You know, stone, throw, hard. What do I think it tells us? Um, how people fought in the Stone Age. You know, maybe you could even use this in, in, in social studies. Um, how my thinking has changed. Well, let's read that page, annotate it. Oh, guess what? This is actually about, um, this, is, this page is actually about how uh, one group of people came to live in one area and how the other group of people disappeared from that area during ancient times. So it's, it's not about, it's a little bit about maybe tools and warfare, but it's actually about how people groups move and change and intermingle over time, okay? And then if you were to look at the next page, maybe it's about how this has happened in different places in the world and at different times in the world. So um, the key here is um, following this sort of process. Before we read, we think about the pictures in this sort of stepwise process. If we annotate, we do that while we're reading. And then we actually reflect back and clarify our thinking, okay? I had mentioned earlier that, um, that annotation scheme, the exclamations, the question marks, plus signs and asterisks. Um, the way that works here is that you, um, you know, students can underline asterisks, so on, okay? Um, they can even put a little word or phrase with it. But this is something that can be done even with a book at home that you read at bedtime. You don't have to use a graphic organizer like this. You could sit down with the Magic School Bus. You could sit down with any book. Um, and before you read the page, you could ask your, your children, what do you notice? What do you think this page is going to be about? Then read it together and discuss what it's really about and get into the habit of doing that. And what you're going to notice is your child is going to be more curious about what's happening. They're going to be noticing more things and they're going to be asking more questions. And as that becomes a structure and a routine, even if it's at bedtime, what you're going to notice is, is that the child is going to carry that routine forward into other aspects of learning and other aspects of life. And it's going to be building a, a very useful skill set. Okay. Um, that leads me. So uh, tips and tricks here. If you have reading to do with children at home, this is a way to engage it. Okay. Don't just read, um, read with thinking. Use thinking to make reading more valuable and actually to make uh, to engage students curiosity in that reading. If you're a teacher and you're assigning reading, um, consider using a thinking routine like this. Um, if you're a no Adam teacher, you have access to these resources on the platform, use them. Um, you can use them in any subject area. Okay. Um, now, a lot of this um, I've, already, I've been mentioning as we go along here has to do with questions. Okay. So, Another big shift that's been happening in education, which uh, will be on full display in, at, as part of this remote learning, is a shift between telling about to helping students 
question and figure out. Okay, so it's a shift from learning about to figuring out. And the method for that involves questions, but not everybody has made that shift. In fact, it's more the minority of schools and classrooms that have made that shift. So there's still a lot of folks that are getting up and telling students and they basic, they'll ask a question, but then they'll look for a specific answer and move on, um, they being the adult. That's not what we're doing here. Um, the way to engage your students in thinking with questions is to develop a question and think of every question as a seed that can grow into other questions, okay? Now, great questions engage students in taking a position. What I mean by a position is taking a risk, um, engaging in those thinking moves in order to give an opinion, um, give some analysis, create an explanation. So again, all higher order thinking, okay? Not so much, we don't, you know, questions that, call, that require students to just remember are lousy questions. Um, it's questions that just require students to apply, you know, one plus two equals three as a rote process, not a great question, okay? What we want is questions that require the students to have to wrestle with the context where the big ideas and the facts are, okay? So if a big idea had to do with the water cycle, okay, and, and how water transforms through the water cycle from a, uh, a cloud to precipitation to a collection to evaporation and, and changes forms from solid, liquid, and gas, and so on, as it goes around, a great question might be something like, why isn't it raining today? Or where did that, you know, why did the puddle disappear? How did, you know, how did it snow 10 minutes ago, but now it's raining? Um, those types of questions cause students to have to take a position because they have to go, hmm, that's because, and they're going to start to give um, an answer with reasoning. And what happens is, is that it's on the teacher or on the, the parent or even on a peer to listen very carefully and to use that student's response as the basis of the next question. And unfortunately, during these times, learning at home, but even in classrooms, um, you've got work going on, you've got kids, you've got school, you've got deliveries, you've got all these things happening. Um, maybe you're trying to get to work, maybe you're you know, quarantined in the garage, who knows, anything could be happening. Um, people are, these are extreme times. Um, it's hard sometimes as an adult to listen to a student. It's actually hard to listen to other adults. It's hard to listen, period. Um, and then not just listen, but to think about listen carefully and think about, and then actually question based on what you've heard, okay? So this is a skill that's tough for adults, um, but you know, it, um, it's something that you can use to have students learn more deeply and engage in those thinking moves. Um, and it's all, it all starts with these questions and it's, how, it's the stuff of how the questions get formed. So the questions that you need to be asking to get students to think more deeply need to be less of the kind of questions that require a specific answer. If a question has a specific answer, it's not a good question. Um, that's why worksheets are considered sort of the lowest form of, you know, work in a classroom. Um, because it's a fill in the blank, you know, there's a specific answer to the specific question. Um, the next, less of, kind of next on the less of list here is questions that focus on defining vocabulary terms. So, you know, um, what is a material? Oh, a material makes up an object. That is a question that focuses on defining a, a, a vocabulary term. Um, fill in the blank style questions um, are kind of obvious. The validating the right answer and invalidating the wrong answer. Um, so the kind of question that's like, 
um, you know, does heat melt ice into liquid? I mean, that's a question that gives you a yes or no, and it's either going to be right or wrong. Again, most of these types of questions are either going to be right or wrong. What we want to have in a question is something um, in, a, in a very effective question that allows us you know, to ask follow-up questions is more of the kind of questions that expose the context for a student's thinking and the depth of their understanding. So if I asked a question like, um, how did that puddle disappear? A student might say something like, it drained into the ground. Oh, well, how did it drain through the concrete on the ground? Or how did it drain through the pavement in the driveway? Hmm. And that causes students to think for a second. They're like, well, actually, I don't think the water can go through the pavement. How could we find out? You know, maybe maybe there's stones we can flip over and look underneath. Um, maybe we can do an experiment. Maybe there's a chunk of concrete by the side of the road that we can just pour a little water on and see does it go straight through. Okay, so it's a basis for experimentation. But the other thing is is that we can also start to reason. A student might be like, well, it did. If it does go through the concrete, it can't go through the concrete that quickly. So it must have gone somewhere else. Um, you know, a follow-up question might be like, well, if it doesn't go through the concrete, or if what if I told you that it didn't go through the concrete? What would you think then? A student might be like, well, I think it just was magic and it disappeared. Um, that might be, or they might say, um, you know, we might have a discussion or about like, well, how about when we wash the car in the summer? Um, does the water stay around? And so it might be like, well, no, because it's so hot out. Well, why would the heat have anything to do with it? And so, you know, you start to get into these follow-up questions that expose the context for the student's thinking. And so what happens is it's like, well, would a puddle in the winter or a puddle in the spring when it's a lot colder than the summer, um, if that's water on the ground, would you expect that to hang around as long as a puddle in the dry, in the same driveway um, in the summertime when it's really warm? Why? Why not? How come? Um, and so the, um, that that's what this means by asking questions that expose the context for students' thinking and the depth of their understanding. Um, other kinds of questions, questions that provide a context for students to use vocabulary terms. So instead of, instead of asking um, you know, students, what is the water cycle? And then they tell you, you know, it's when water goes around, you know, because that's what they were told and that's what was on the sheet or whatever. We could ask a question like, you know, how does a cloud become a puddle? And the student would have to give us some context, but then we'll, it would tell us if they use the water cycle as a way of describing how a cloud becomes a puddle, because that tells us if they really have um, mastered and internalized that vocabulary term, and it's not just the result of rote recall. Um, rote recall is very hard to replicate unless the same trigger, sort of same intellectual trigger is pulled, which is why children who learn in rote learning environments perform uh, poorly when compared to students who live and uh, um, uh, learn in more um, next generation uh, thinking centered classrooms. Um, so we want to ask questions that expose students thinking. We also want to ask questions that challenge not only inaccurate thinking and assumptions and understanding, but also accurate. Because a student um, most times will have learned that if they give the right answer, if they can guess what's in your mind, then they get to move on um, because that's correct or that's mastery or something like this. But in fact, um, we want students to be critical thinkers of both what they believe is accurate, what they believe is inaccurate, and to learn the skills to challenge both, but also to expect to be challenged. Um, and so the kind of questions that you can ask are things like, um, well, you know, if a student had an accurate assumption, you know, um, um, the cold makes water evaporate. Like really, how does that work? 
and 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 follow them through it. This is what it means to be a thought partner. And they explain, you're like, well, okay, but um, why is it that you know puddles freeze and they stay around for a, a really long time in the winter? Um, because I think freezing is really cold water, isn't it? That challenges an incorrect assumption. A correct, uh, 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 challenging an accurate assumption would be something like, well, you know, I hear you say that um, it's warmer in the summertime and that causes the puddle to evaporate uh, more quickly, but I don't understand how that could be. And so that will tell you if they really understand that by adding heat energy, it causes the, um, the water to change state from a solid, uh, from a liquid to a gas. Um, or, so that's phase change. Or if they understand maybe the, at a molecular level that the atoms move apart because of the heat energy that's added. And so they go from being a liquid to a gas. Um, so that's how questions get at the root. And then you can ask follow-up questions. Why would that happen? What would happen if it, what, what, why is cold different? Oh, well, it's heat's removed. So the atoms and molecules come together. If you remove enough heat, they become a solid. You know, the gas becomes a liquid and then the liquid becomes a solid, and so on. So effective um, questions are um, not about what you're asking as much as how you're asking it. And I just have a couple of examples here and I'm basically out of time. I apologize for going over here a little bit on you. I only have like two more slides, um, but here's an example. Um, a question that's not great. Who remembers what a material is? Um, a question that's much better. Why do some objects look different than others? Because the answer to this question is all about materials. The materials that make up an object are responsible for why they look different, and the you know what an what a material is is uh, the matter that makes up an object, and objects can be made of different materials. Um, so that tells us much more about the student's depth of understanding. Here's another one. Um, you know, somebody might ask a fill in the blank question. Different blanks have different blank. So this might be different objects have different materials or different materials have different atoms, who knows what. Um, but let's say that it, um, we turn that around and we say, you know, why would we care if students can bring glass bottles to school? Why do we care if students can bring glass bottles to school? Well, we care because they break. Well, why do glass bottles break? Because the materials that they're made of are fragile and if you drop them, you know, it's hard and it, it breaks, it shatters. And, to little pieces of glass. Oh, well, I drop my plastic bottle all the time and it doesn't break into little pieces of glass. Why not? Oh, well, that's because it's made of a different material. Oh, why does that matter? Well, because different materials have different properties. What's a property? Oh, that's like, you know, um, you know what it looks like, how it feels, but also how it behaves. Um, so like plastic, can bend and, and stretch and bounce when it's in a bottle shape, but glass can't do that as well, okay? So you learn a lot more from the second question than you do from the first, and it actually becomes a seed to a discussion. And here's the last one for you. Um, again, back to it's not what you ask, but how you ask it. Um, instead of validating, you know, yes, you're right, ask a, ask a follow-up question. So kind of building on the one that I had a second ago, why would using a flexible material for the bottle itself make it safer? And if a student says, oh, well, you know, when you drop it, it'll bounce and it won't smash into little pieces, I could ask a follow-up question to see how deeply they're really thinking about it and challenge their assumptions. I could say, well, if the bottle doesn't break when it's dropped, but it cracks or melts when it's heated, when we put hot chocolate inside, would you think that's a, a, a safe bottle? And the student might be like, oh, well, when I think of glass and bottles at school, I think of people running and dropping things. I never really think about somebody putting something hot in it, like hot chocolate, or putting it in a microwave and heating stuff really hot in there. Hmm. And your student might even say things like, well, you know, um, you could ask a question like, what, what if you put something hot in it and it tastes different? Um, do you think that's safe? 
Um, so there's a lot of different ways. And so the thing is, is that when you're at home, as a parent working with your student, look at the work that you're getting and the work that's not valuable, that does not provide a context for students to engage their thinking, I would say place that aside. That's the work you get to if you get to it. The work that you want to focus on is this, the work that engages students in what we call higher order thinking of these thinking moves. And um, those thinking moves are going to uh, serve students, well, first of all, they're going to be skills, but they're going to serve students well across all the disciplines, um, but they are just going to serve them well in life in general when it comes to problem solving and being independent um, thinkers and actors and, and having agency in the world that they're a part of. Um, and I don't care if your student is, um, you know, whatever socioeconomic background or um, language background or um, you know, learning disability or so on. These, um, these are skills that all children uh, can be challenged with and they can develop and um, a way of learning that works for all kids. And in fact, it tends to work better because the, um, the methods or sort of the paths to success are more numerous. Um, there's many of them as opposed to um, having to read well and remember well as being the only path to success, um, which for a lot of children, people like myself with language-based learning disabilities um, are not, um, they're barriers. You know, they're, they, they promote inequity as opposed to remove it. So with that said, um, uh, I know I have a number of folks who've said thank you and so on. Um, we are going to, if there's any questions, feel free to drop them in there right now. Um, and I'll just take a quick scan over. I wanted to let you know that um, this recording will be available online. You'll be sent a follow-up email with a link to it. Um, and uh, if you would like any resources uh, from this, uh, be happy to reach, you know, feel free to reach out and um, take a look at our website, noadam.com. If you go to learn more uh, or the curriculum section, uh, the curriculum section has samples of readers for each grade level K to eight, um, which you're welcome to use if you are, you know, you don't have access to Know Adam in your community. Um, and there's all kinds of information on that. There's also, if you go to the learn more section, lots of eBooks, blog posts, um, even gra graphic organizers and things like that. And um, we'll also, we also have other webinars too that are available and other professional development opportunities that um, are coming up that are free like this one. So I'd encourage you to um, you know, sign up for our blog, stay in touch. I hope you found this helpful and um, you know, feel free to share with your community. Um, just taking a look at this. Um, some folks have asked about things, um, and I appreciate all the thank yous, um, about certificates of attendance, um, things that you can use for uh, CEUs or PDPs, that sort of thing. Yes, um, all you have to do is actually, you should receive one after this session. You'll receive a cert certificate if, if that is inadequate for, um, for some reason for your particular community's needs, feel free to reach back to us and we can issue you one uh, from here. Um, and if you had any audio issues or connection issues, um, there was uh, one or two reports of that. It is probably the internet connection on your side. The recording will be uh, perfect audio. So when you get the recording, feel free to you know, review that from another location when you have a better audio connection and, um, and you should be in good shape. Thank you very much. Uh, again, thank you for your day, uh, this hour of your day. Good luck and um, hang in there. This is almost over. Bye-bye.